Hello, I'm delighted to provide you with this keynote address for the Suarez Paris Conference. This address deals with social science and society in the 21st century. I'll be looking at some larger global themes and social science attempts to try to address some of these themes. My name is Ross Burkhart. I'm a professor of political science in the School of Public Service at Boise State University in Boise, Idaho, United States. As a brief introduction to my scholarship, I consider my work to mainly be in the area of comparative political economy and also some political culture. Topics that I engage include economic development and democracy, income inequality and democracy, the relationship between the two, as well as the relationship between economic system employed by a country, capitalist or socialist, and democracy, the extent to which human rights are practiced in countries around the world and their level of democracy, the connection between political culture of what we call borderlands regions and environmental policy making, as well as forecasting elections. I've published in several journals, the American Political Science Review, the Journal of Politics, the European Journal of Political Research, Social Science Journal, Journal of Borderland Studies, Canadian Journal of Public Policy, Journal of Political Science and Public Opinion. And I'm also the politics editor for an open source journal called the Social Sciences and Humanities Open. And I encourage you to consider SSHO as a potential outlet for your research. So what do we see around the world? I'm going to focus on challenges, major challenges to our global order. One major challenge, of course, are the number of wars that are taking place around the world. Ukraine, Gaza, Sudan. Many mass casualties have resulted, probably about half a million if we add all of them up. And those wars continue. So that continues to be a troubling aspect of global affairs. There have also been some authoritarian shifts, illiberal democracy in the famous uh, phrase, that have taken place in countries around the world, in Europe, Latin America, East and Southeast Asia, North America as well. Radicalism in terms of populism, soft authoritarianism, Whatever phrase we might consider to use, uh, these have also emerged on the global scene. We've also seen, very recently, the warmest years in recorded history, and the climate catastrophe that appears to be occurring, extreme weather events, global warming, in fact, warming beyond that of international agreements, and the great consequences that has for human life around the world. These, of course, are major global challenges. So what do people do in the face of challenges? Well, there are a lot of different actions, of course. I'm going to look at three of them for the time being. Diplomacy, of course, is a major way to try to confront issues of importance to the globe as a whole. The art of compromise and settlement uh, to try to address global issues is alive and well. For all the wars that we see, for instance, uh, we've seen some successes, the Good Friday Agreement, the Abraham Accords, have all tried to address issues of conflict in peaceful manners. Diplomacy, of course, is a way to try to address global problems. Direct action is also a, another way that we try to address problems whether it's through public protest, for instance, in the United States, in the Black Lives Matter movement. We can also uh, certainly consider uh, protests against uh, wars, Ukraine, Gaza, and so forth. There are other types of direct action that I would include in this definition. Uh, some of them would be perhaps more passive, such as at the ballot box. There are many elections that will be taking place in 2024. Taiwan, Russia, India, the UK, the US, that will all have significant impact on global affairs. 
That's another example of direct action that humans take to try to address problems. A policy-oriented way to address issues uh, is development. In other words, the switch to renewable energies is a, a development uh, track that has taken place recently. The increased presence of microcredit in small businesses in uh, countries around the world. An emphasis on eco-development or creating conditions for uh, economic growth, but also considering the environment within that uh, realm of economic growth. All of those are ways in which we can try to address issues of global importance. What of social science? What are things that we seem to have learned about uh, society from the world of social science research? We hesitate to use uh, the term iron law or something that is invariable uh, in uh, our scholarship, uh, but some things seem to be relatively consistent uh, in our observation of how society uh, deals with challenges. For instance, uh, one of these uh, generalizations, perhaps the most widespread generalization, linking political systems to other aspects of society, has been that democracy is related to the state of economic development. Of course, this comes from Seymour Martin Lipsitz, uh, famous formulation in the American Political Science Review, as well as in his book, Political Man. This has generated a lot of research, uh, over 12,000 citations in Google Scholar, and the uh, idea being that societies that tend to have more development, uh, higher levels of economic development, tend to have more open political systems. So the chart on the right is taken from his 1959 APSR article demonstrating that uh, democracies tend to have higher levels of development. But is this invariably true? Not necessarily. Scholarship has also established that democracy tends to have a certain threshold aspect to it, such that one cannot expect levels of development to unerringly lead to higher levels of democracy. In fact, as this graph from Robert Jackman's 1973 article in the American Journal of Political Science shows, there is a tapering off effect of economic development, that only so much can go toward um, increased democratic performance. And scholarship has de demonstrated this fairly consistently. Some research that um, I have co-published has also demonstrated that through specific Granger causality tests from the world of economics, that economic development appears to statistically cause democracy, but democracy does not appear to statistically cause economic development. And this also seems to be holding relatively true uh, in countries around the world, even though that finding was from several decades ago. Also from several decades ago, we can determine that economic development leads to democracy in a much more muted uh, fashion in countries that are developing or have lower levels of economic development. So that relationship that Lipset laid out that actually goes back to Aristotelian times that uh, economic development leads to more open political systems has a lot of caveats associated with it. But still, there is a consistent relationship between the extent to which a country has wealth and uh, its openness in terms of its political system. Not perfect, but it's there. What else might we know? Well, from the world of comparative political economy, we know that um, as far as elections go and what voters think about, voters tend to think a lot about the economy. And that's certainly the case in the United States in the upcoming elections. The economy will be a very much a dominant issue. Edward Tufte, uh, back in the 1970s, suggested that when you think economics, think elections. And when you think elections, think economics. Michael Lewis Beck also elaborated on this to suggest that economics appears to have been an enduring factor in post-World War II legislative elections. This finding was across several Western European countries. And we also find this to be true, uh, comparative uh, political economists and voting behavior scholars in countries around the world. 
Is it a perfect relationship? No, it is not. My finding that I have on this particular slide suggests that incumbent candidates uh, do frequently win uh, presidential elections if the economy is doing well, but it is not an unerring relationship. For instance, out of uh, the 14 elections that incumbent candidates have won in the past 20, 11 of them were during good economic times, but three of them were during relatively bad economic times. Incumbent candidates also can lose during good economic times. So the relationship is not perfect. There's clearly more to elections than simply economic determinism, but it, economics is very much a heavy variable to consider. So for instance, the Biden administration's focus on uh, such things as gas prices and lower inflation have a political component to them, as well as an economic component. And those are things that come from the world of social science research. So how does social science research help us to better understand global problems? Well, the relationships that I've looked at so far, the relationship between development and democracy, the relationship between economics and voting, uh, suggest that cooperative strategies uh, may in fact help uh, humans to um, deal with global issues. Robert Axelrod, in his famous book, The Evolution of Cooperation, laid out the claim through experimental evidence that tit-for-tat is the optimal default social strategy. If you're not cooperative toward me, I'm unlikely to be cooperative toward you, but if you're cooperative toward me, I'm more likely to be cooperative toward you. And cooperation tends to be the default action of humans. So cooperation is met with cooperation. This can be an important catalyst for economic development, for diplomatic relations to take place even during difficult times, and for democracy to occur. Thus, perhaps it's uh, hardwired in us to have more of an instinct toward cooperation than we tend to give ourselves credit for. It's certainly true that the human condition is likely to have problems and issues associated with it. That also seems to be inherent in us. Life is not perpetually peaceful. Glenn Tinder, in his book Political Thinking, lays out something called humane uncertainty as a way to try to address this particular condition. And to somewhat oversimplify it, but to give the general idea, if we can envision our world, then we can be empowered within it. In other words, if we can create uh, in our minds uh, important uh, conditions that could better us as humanity, then we in fact could uh, come to create those conditions. So we empower ourselves by envisioning our world. It's certainly possible that the visions that we create can be troubling, fascism, Nazism, for instance, or they could be inspiring and be much more cooperative. And it is up for us, it is really up to us to decide what our vision for the globe happens to be. Social science can certainly help in finding relationships between um, certain social aspects that can create for uh, create better human conditions. So social science is indeed an important intellectual tool for better understanding ourselves. If we can empower ourselves to make good choices, then we potentially can have a positive impact on even the most troubling of global conditions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I have some contact information here as well as a website where you can find further um, information about my scholarship. And I welcome any comments that you have on this presentation. Thank you again and I hope you have a very good conference.